Welcome to OIA Conversations, where we share information and learn more about people, programs, and issues that are important and relevant to the United States territories and to the freely associated states. I'm Tanya Joshua, Deputy Director of Policy and Communications Lead in the Office of Insular Affairs here at the Department of the Interior. Today, we have the honor to speak with Trina Liberer, D Director of the Nature Conservancy's Pacific Regional Partnerships Program. Hi, Trina, welcome. Thank you, Tanya. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Please tell us about your, uh, your role with the Nature Conservancy and the islands that you cover. I work, I, I have the wonderful opportunity to work in um, the islands uh, across US affiliated Micronesia. So I live and work in Guam. Um, we work with the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, Republic of Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And I also um, help support some of our work in American Samoa and French Polynesia as well. What are your goals in the, in the Pacific currently? So um, the Nature Conservancy has, we, we also have um, programs in Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands as well, which I also support a little bit, but the, all of our work in the Pacific is really around um, a few key uh, components. We, we focus a lot on um, ridge to reef, uh, sort of watershed level management and planning. We um, focus on, we help uh, partners to establish protected areas and try to make them effective. And um, we focus on um, fisheries management and, and uh, really looking at um, ecosystem-based approaches to fisheries management, working with our um, local partners. And um, uh, what's becoming, of course, more in the news um, with climate impacts and the new IPCC report, we also really um, try to help uh, enhance the resilience of um, nature and people uh, in the face of climate change impacts. So those are those are kind of the key pillars of areas where we work. Could you just explain? You mentioned IPCC. Could you could you explain what that is to our audience? Yeah, it's uh, it's. I'm now I'm going to screw up, but I think it's that um, international panel on climate change that um, they have been putting out reports uh, over the years, and um, each report has become kind of more and more dire, which is is scary. And this latest report just came out and really um, emphasizes there's no uh, room that the, that the current impacts we're seeing are definitely man-made, definitely human-induced. Um, we have a very narrow band of time to try, and um, we, we certainly can't um, ameliorate all the climate impacts we've, we've um, unleashed, but we have at least a, a narrow band to try and make them livable and do, you know, to make um, them less terrible. And so it's sort of a kind of a, we have about a 10 year period to really, really get serious about reducing our emissions and switching to carbon neutral um, uh, technology, you know, to really get a uh, real investment in renewables and to, to try and keep the, um, I think it's the, the target um, temperature rise to one and a half degrees um, it, so that we don't have, you know, we will have a world that's harder to, to we'll have more, um, you know, forest fires and torrential rains and bigger storms. But if we all work collectively in the next 10 years, we at least can keep it to a level where we, we can maybe keep up with enhancing our resilience and adapting and, and managing the, the impacts. But it is scary, it's really scary. And especially for the islands, it's very scary because for example, Marshall Islands and some of the other low-lying countries, um, it's an existential threat, right? The sea level rise, um, is, you know, something that they are cognizant of daily and how, how are they going to, um, what are they going to do as it, as it continues to rise and where will they go if they can't stay in their islands? Right. Um, so what are you doing in terms of the island areas, uh, in terms of building that resilience? What would you say are some of the main features of the work that you do to build resilience? So a, a, a lot of the things I mentioned earlier are kind of are interconnected. So one of our key programs is um, trying to uh, 
it, in many of the islands, reef fish are um, prized and people love to eat reef fish. And there have been um, localized over harvest of reef fish. And so uh, especially herbivorous fish, the ones that eat algae, really are, have a key role to play in managing the health of the, the coral reef ecosystem, which of course the coral reefs have a key role to play in mitigating storm surge and, and protecting islands. They're critically important for tourism for some of the islands. They're critically important um, as home to fish. Uh, and so we have been really working closely with a lot of our local partners to um, go through a process, a participatory process called Fish Path of saying, okay, we know, you know, we need to understand the um, health of the, the populations of fish that you prize, try to figure out what are some of the ways to, so understand, do um, data poor stock assessments, understand what the health of the stock levels are, then what are some of the options you could you do in terms of management that will recover the stocks to a level where they're helping keep nature healthy, but they're also providing food security for our islands. We, um, in many cases, we had a, a long standing project in the Northern Reefs in Palau where the two states we worked with, Kaimal and Narlong, made a decision to have a moratorium on certain reef fish they were very um, worried about. And then, you know, because it's hard to, to uh, prevent people from fishing, we've tried to help to redirect some of that effort to more uh, sustainable nearshore pelagic fish. So uh, the fish like some of the nearshore tunas, um, bonitas, the, the mahi, and then um, helping maybe set up uh, anchored FAD systems. So the FADs are fish aggregating devices so that fishermen don't waste fuel and time at trying to find the fish. If there's a play, you can put these um, systems in near shore and then the fishermen have a better sense that, okay, if I go fishing on this, at this time on this day, that they're, they're, the odds of finding fish will be higher. So trying to kind of alleviate the pressure on the reef fish for a while while they can recover, but allowing people to have food security of locally caught fish and sort of trying to put that all together in a very um, participatory way of working with, you know, working with the local communities, the local leaders, the fishermen, what will work best for you to try to recover these resources. And then that of course builds kind of the, the social resilience of the community as if they have, you know, um, locally caught sustainable food but they're allowing the, the reef to recover to continue to protect, you know, provide storm water protection or storm surge protection um, and, and the other ecosystem, what we call ecosystem benefits and the ecosystem services, then that in the long run, they will be better able to bounce back when there's a typhoon or there's a drought or there's, a, you know, mudslides from torrential rain or something like that. So that's, that's the hope. Do, um, Trina, you mentioned partners. Uh, who do you partner with uh, in the island areas? Is it government? Is it other NGOs? Is it who? Who are your partners? It, that's a great question, and we partner with uh, everybody. So we do. We like to work. Um, I, we work very closely with local communities and and tribal networks, but also with the governments because um, you need a, the the nobody can do it all alone, right? The governments have a role to play. The local communities and the and the clans and tribal networks have a role to play. We also do have um, the Nature Conservancy has been working in the Pacific since 1990, so um, 31 years. And one of the things we wanted to do when we uh, started was to to help build the local capacity. Um, and so we've helped start many of the conservation NGOs in the region. We helped to start Micronesia Conservation Trust. We helped to start Palau Conservation Society, uh, Conservation Society Punpe, you know, lots of um, it, or if there were existing ones like the YAP Community Action Program, we've tried to help strengthen them and provide technical assistance or resources as they needed. And so we work a lot. There's a whole network of um, uh, local conservation NGOs now, and we work with universities. The University of Guam Sea Grant Program is a great program, uh, the Center for Island Sustainability. And more recently, we've started to work more, um, really focus on women's 
uh, groups and, and, and like existing women, women's associations, because they have a real, you know, if you invest in women and girls, you really, that, that's a real um, strong return on investment because they are, they're usually filter out to the community really, really strongly. And, um, and then we've also, the Nature Conservancy and the uh, sort of writ large, we have a big organization of like 4,800 staff across, you know, we're working across like 72 countries. Um, we really have strong private sector partnerships. And so that's something that the Pacific is starting to move into more is working with some private sector partners as well. Could you tell us about the Micronesia Challenge 2030? Yes, um, that has been something that certainly the Nature Conservancy has been a key partner on and, and really committed to, but it was um, something that the uh, president, uh, former president of Palau, uh, Tommy Ramengas Au Jr. Um, launched in 2006. He, he, he actually um, started um, uh, engaging with the other uh, leaders in Micronesia in 2005 saying, um, you know, let's collectively do this together. Let's work together to effectively. So the initial Micronesia challenge was to effectively conserve at least 30% of the nearshore marine resources and 20% of the terrestrial resources across the whole, across the the region of um, Palau, FSM, Marshall Islands, um, Guam, and Northern Mariana Islands at, by the year 2020. So that was a, a, a real focus on protected areas and a real focus on protection. It was uh, a nice collaboration of governments and again, NGOs and community partners and other and federal agencies, the Department of Interior, the Office of Insular Affairs was a key early partner, provided lots of resources. And then um, as we got closer to 2020, we, and we had, you know, we did a, a very um, uh, comprehensive evaluation, which is, I can, we can make available the website so people can look at it. We, we realized we, you know, there had been a lot of progress made, huge amount in new protected areas, new trained um, individuals, capacity built, governance, new policies. But there was still more to do. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the urgency of climate change and the urgency of other things, the COVID-19 really made it clear that islands need to be really self-reliant. So there was a real push to go, okay, we need something, we need to go bigger and more and build on the great success. So in um, 2019 at the 24th um, uh, summit of the uh, Micronesian Island uh, Forum, the leaders got together and they said, okay, we want to do, we want to expand on what we did. And so the new Micronesia 2030 was endorsed there. And it, it the, there's still an effective management component, but now it's beyond near shore marine. It's out to the exclusive economic zone. So out to 200 nautical miles, and that's effective management of 50% marine, uh, effective management of 30% terrestrial. And then in addition to that, it's Things like focusing on integrating um, fisheries management with these protected areas. It's um, helping to improve the adaptation and resilience of uh, local communities in the face of climate change, especially for the low-lying islands. So a lot of the outer islands maybe weren't given as much focus during the initial Micronesia challenge. And it's really an idea of like, who are our most vulnerable communities and how can we help them? There's a real push to now um, in, increase livelihood opportunities that would depend on sustainable natural resources to really help make you know that idea of a circular economy. How are what are the ways we can be more self-reliant? And um, then the uh, the final one was to really look at invasive species, decrease invasive species, and really um, improve habitat restoration because we do have. Some, some, you know, Guam is, of course, sort of ground zero for invasive species, and they are key. They're um, key in both reducing your resilience and, you know, impacting things like food security and other things. So, so it's a, it's now the new target is, of course, 2030. So it's called the uh, Magnesia Challenge 2030, and um, we just had a wonderful virtual forum with the five leaders present um, to kick things off, and we're now going down separate tracks to to plan out things that we did. We had a follow-on forum for the invasive species group to try to, to think about what that will look like going forward to 2030. 
we're starting to look at the fisheries and how to build that into our, um, we have a longstanding Micronesia Challenge Measures Working Group and figuring out, okay, how are we gonna continue to track progress? What are the key indicators we wanna look at? So it's very exciting. I think it's, it's really a, a, a wonderful way uh, to show regional collaboration. Absolutely. Now, what if federal partners were interested in, in these initiatives? Uh, is there a website that partners can go look in look at? How do they? How do federal partners engage? Because we have many federal partners uh, who do many different things and might want to engage with the region in, in different ways. What would your advice be? Um, well, first, I would recognize beyond uh, Office of Insular Affairs, we have wonderful federal partners. That um, NOAA has been a key partner from the beginning the um, uh, U.S. Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and others. So we have uh, many, many have already engaged, but for anybody interested, the, there is a website. It's um, Micronesia Challenge, all one word, dot org. Um, and there are also, um, you know, we, we're, we're starting to hold more of these virtual events. So we're happy, we have a regional support team. I happen to chair the regional support team, and I'm happy to always have, we have something like 190 emails on that address, and I'm always happy to pull in new folks. We have quarterly, roughly quarterly calls. Um, and so absolutely always welcoming of new partners, for sure. And, and you're right. I mean, perhaps my question was not, not correct, because you're right, you know, the U.S. federal government, all of these different agencies are already involved. So, so that was- uh, Many of them are, quite, for uh, sure. <laughs> Um, I have a quick question just to close out on the Micronesia Challenge. Uh, I'm reading this uh, sort of cheat sheet about the Micronesia Challenge and all of the benefits, many of which you've named. Talk to us a little bit about how it inspired action around the world. That's, it's a lovely story, I think, because islands in general, the, the, so the Micronesia Challenge was one of the first sort of big initiatives um, to really, the, the, so um, the Micronesia Challenge itself was inspired by Fiji, the country saying um, that the original um, United Nations targets for protection were 10% marine and 12% um, terrestrial. And Fiji said, no, we, we care, we really need to think about 30% protection for our marine um, areas. They're so important to us. And that really inspired President Mengesau. And he thought, well, I think, you know, Micronesia is such a um, culturally and, and it's such a uh, region like, you know, they, they, it's one of the few places in the world where the region really does work at a regional scale. There's a lot of connections. They've been working together for many, many years over, you know, things like education, transportation, environment. So this idea of like, let's do something bigger and think about it as a regional initiative. And then that inspired the Coral Triangle Initiative, the, the um uh, it inspired the Caribbean challenge and the, and then eventually the Western Indian Ocean coastal challenge. And one of the interesting pieces that my dear friend, Kate Brown, who's the um, uh, coordinator for the Global Island Partnership for GLISPA and the Micronews Challenge was one of the first sort of initiatives to help build this Global Island Partnership is that the Micronews Challenge inspired the Aloha Plus Challenge in Hawaii that then kind of morphed into the Hawaii Green Growth Initiative that then inspired the Guam Green Growth Initiative back in Guam. So it's like a really nice um, circle of learning and improving and in building on and then sharing. And it's just, you know, and now we work really closely. The Guam Green Growth Initiative works really closely with the Aloha Plus Challenge to we're building, we're trying to learn from them how to build a dashboard that will be very interactive and used by the community. So it's really a lovely um, sense of um, here's what we're doing, help us make it better. What can you, what can we do to help and others jumping in and, and, and building from it. So it's lovely. Uh, I was reading your bio and you mentioned, speaking of Guam, you mentioned wanting to expand more into Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about that? Yes. So um, the Nature Conservancy, we, as I mentioned, we've been working in the Pacific since 1990, but we started in Palau and then we worked in um, Puente that expanded to um, the whole FSM. And then slowly, slowly started working in Marshall Islands, Guam and the Northern Marianas. But we haven't really focused as much attention in the U.S. territories. And so um, one of the areas we'd like to 
explore new opportunities and especially building on um, the Guam, the G3 and CNMI is really focused also on um, uh, achieving the sustainable development goals as well. And so it's a it's a nice opportunity for the Nature Conservancy to, to try and figure out where are we most value added? Where can we help to, to really, um, uh, it, are there areas that um, Guam or CNMI or American Samoa are interested in exploring and can we help? And, and so one of the places we're starting to look in, um, especially in, in Guam is, uh, but the region as well is, is um, bringing more uh, expertise on invasive species. We ourselves sort of ha had lost a lot of our expertise and have now started rebuilding it again because it's such a key component. So we've started to, to think about working more on that and, and how do we help bring resources to the Micronesia Biosecurity Plan and, and things like that. We've also, um, I've been working with Christine Farron in the um, Guam Division of Forestry to look at um, helping with an assessment of need so they are able to access forest legacy grants. So there's a lot of opportunities that um, we've been you know, exploring the um, uh, conservation efforts on Cocos Island. Yeah, so there's, a, there's just a lot of potential opportunity there. So it's, it, for me, it's fun because it's where I live. I've chosen to live here for 27 years. <laughs> so yes, it's, you, you've been it's in definitely home. home. Quite, quite a long time. Yes. You, you, you've become, you, you are, you are part of Guam for sure. I certainly feel like it's home for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, now there's another project coming forth in Palau. I believe it's called the Our Oceans Conference. Are you involved with that? Yes, we are. Um, unfortunately, that was um, a casualty of COVID. So originally, the Our Oceans event, it's a, it's a conference. This is the conference that was start, but, um, was begun by Secretary Kerry, former Secretary of State um, John Kerry, to really focus more effort on um, the oceans writ large and how important they are. And um, so uh, Palau is very excited to be one of the, it was certainly the first Pacific Island to host this global event. Um, and it was meant for uh, 2020. And unfortunately, um, because of COVID, it's been postponed. But um, now the plan is to, the, the new plan is to host an in-person event in February of 2022. And um, so uh, the Nature Conservancy has been invited by the Palauan government just to help with, um, you know, we've provided some technical assistance on the, uh, we're working with Dr. Yim Golbu from the, the Palau International Quarry Center, who's um, charted, charged with the, the program development. So we've given some insights as, as have other um, key partners. And then we've also, um, been helping to originally we helped to coordinate some of the other NGO um, involvement in just brainstorming ideas of what what are some of the key important things that should be on the program. Um, we will be helping host a side event at the at the event to showcase the Micronesia Challenge 2030 and kind of what's next and how to how to drive more resources to it. Um, but there's, it's a wonderful event because it's really focused on commitments, like tangible commitments. And then Palau really wants to focus on not new commitments as much as what have you done so far in your previous tangible commitments. So we really can understand, like, are we being effective? Are we, are we really um, achieving what we set out to do? But then, of course, there will be um, some new concrete tangible commitments. But it's a very... Um, it's meant to be a really working meeting of like really committing to, to new management and protections for the oceans. And, and there's um, six tracks. And, and so it's, uh, it should be, ho hopefully, fingers crossed that COVID doesn't um, prevent it again, but it should be a nice event to, to um, showcase some of the, and, and again, it's not, even though it's in the Pacific and the Pacific, there will be a Pacific pavilion. It really is a global event, so there'll be um, hopefully people from uh, all over can come. Um, so we're speaking with Trina Leberer, um, Director of Pacific Regional Partnerships with the Nature Conservancy. Um, I do have a couple more questions. My one question is really, if you could give us an, an example of a successful uh, partnership that you have done, and what does that really tangibly, you said, look like? You know, what does it look like? 
uh, for those of us who might be far away and not really see um, what is the definition of a successful partnership and how does that translate on the ground for the people? Um, so I've talked so much about the Micronesia Challenge, so I think I'll shift gears a little and talk about um, the Pacific Island Managed and Protected Areas Community, PIMPAC, which was also supported um, with early grants from uh, NOAA. It's co-coordinated by NOAA, but the um, Office of Insular Affairs has also contributed over the years. Um, and the idea behind that partnership was that um, it, especially at the time, it's, it, it began around 2005, there was a real push to create protected areas around the world and managed areas around the world. Um, but there was a lot, not so much a focus on sort of like how to um, set them up for success. You know, so how to make sure they're not just paper parks, they're not just drawn on a map, but they actually are doing what they're designed to do and that communities are benefiting from them, that they're not just locking them up and throwing away the key. So um, PIMPAC was really a, a, a it's, what I think makes a great partnership is um, a real collaboration uh, where it, you're co-creating it, everybody's creating it together. So we had a, a great kickoff meeting. It was happened to be in Guam because it's kind of centrally located where we really, you know, the, the the kind of the sky was the limit. Like we had real brainstorming of what really needs to happen to make sure that these protection area, that these protected areas and these um, managed efforts succeed. And so we really thought about thoughtfully like, okay, what are the, what do practitioners need to be successful? And so we really focused in on that level of folks. And, and we also decided um, and, and I think it can, it can vary by what you're trying to do, but I think a, a successful partnership is, is informal. It's like what, who wants to be in the room and who wants to get the work done and who want, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to always be a big formal MOU or a big, you know, it's, it's really like, where is the creative energy and where is the passion to, to move things together? So PIMPAC has remained a very loose community. It's a kind of a community of practice and, um, the Nature Conservancy is a key partner, NOAA is a key partner, and MCT, Micronesia Conservation Trust, key partner to help try to figure out what people need. So the first thing we knew that people needed was management planning experience. So that's something TNC had put a lot of energy and effort into. So we helped to, to um, work with those other partners to adapt some of our planning tools to really make it user-friendly for local communities. And then, you know, now lately we've, um, there's been a shift. Um, PIMPAC has really understood the focus needs to be on compliance management and how to, how do you get people to, so you've set up your protected area, you've made a plan, you've done all their work, and then people maybe aren't following the rules. And so how do you want, how do you get them to understand to want to follow the rules or how do you enforce if they're just not going to follow the rules? And so I think that to me, that's a, the idea of a successful partnership is really it's the people who really care and if they feel like they're in from the beginning and they're co-creating what it's going to be and it's really um, driven by what people need I think you can have the recipe for a successful partnership. Trina are there any we've talked a lot about uh, ocean but as we close was there anything you did mention invasive species which our office has supported a lot of um, to combat mm -hmm. Anything in particular about land resources maybe that you wanted to add in? Um, how about maybe the Micronesia region? What's what's of value in the Micronesia region that 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 we're protecting or that you're working to protect? The biodiversity in this part of the world is amazing. There are over 1,300 species of reef fish, there are 480 species of corals, 85 species of birds, half of which are endemic, which means they're found nowhere else in the world and 1,400 species of plants, 200 of which are also endemic. So simply put, this is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. So terrestrially, I, I think what, um, and that kind of goes back to even the Micronesia Challenge, there, there was originally, the, the language was forest, and then there was a sense, no, but it's bigger than just forest, because you know what's a forest in Marshall Islands compared to like the cloud forest of Pompeii? So I think, I think that you're absolutely right. I think in general, people focus on marine for Pacific Islands just because the marine is, you know, they're big ocean states. They're, but the, the land is critical. Obviously, the land is critical. It's where the people live. So I think um, 
what I've noticed is a real emphasis on, um, you know, not, so it's there, there is a real emphasis on watershed restoration because a lot of the watersheds have been, um, you know, altered for various reasons, but there is also a real sense of the importance of culture and the importance of, you know, like YAP has been managing their watersheds forever, like for a long time about, um, how, you know, what are the culturally important plants, the, you know, whether it's taro or yams or, you know, how, how do you um, ensure that agroforestry is integrated with sort of your watershed efforts and how, how do you ensure that, um, uh, that, that the, 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 all the, the uh, work you're doing on the land is a benefit to the communities that you you know, that there's buffer zones though for nature, for, you know, bird corridors or things, you know, what, what are some of the, and, and certainly they're, they're all connected, right? If you, Guam has lost a lot of our forest birds, so we don't have as much um, seed transport for some of our plants because that was done by birds. And so, you know, it's it's really figuring out kind of the whole system. And because they're, the, it's certainly Micronesia, they're small islands, you have the ability to um, work at the whole system level. You know, you really can see, okay, I can see the top of the watershed and how things are affecting the to the ocean. So I think in some ways it's easier to get people to understand but I think it. I think the real focus is is thinking about thinking more broadly what forest is that it's agroforestry that it's things that are important culturally that it's you know all the whole system is important to to people and how do you make sure that it's um, benefiting nature but it's also benefiting local communities. I'm very curious, Trina. Is there any? Uh, how does language play into any of this work, or does it? I, it certainly does, and I I I wish I spoke. Uh, I can't speak tomorrow. I wish I could. Um, I I think um, language is huge. That everybody has, you know. I do understand. I I know a lot of the like the fish names in tomorrow, and I you know, and and I think that's you you start to understand because um, like fish names, for example, they you, there's different names for different life stages, right? Because they were you know they were valued for different things, and so. So people, I, I definitely language is, is critical to understanding sort of what, what did make people um, resilient in the past, you know, like how did they use the resources? How did they use them sustainably? How can we build on that to, to move forward? I think what though is also interesting about Micronesia is because of the, the long um, influence of the United States, everybody can speak English too. So you can, work across islands more easily than maybe in some other parts of the world. Um, so it's, it's you know, you have the ability at least to have some common language people can share, but I think that you don't ever lose the richness of all the various languages and cultures and how critically important they are to understanding how resources were managed in the past and building on that to, to try and take that forward with um, with new new science, uh, you know things that uh, scientific developments that in technologies that can help be blended with with the um, uh, the more traditional management. But I think that definitely um, when I've worked with local communities on like conservation plans, I've always told them just talk in your own language and ask me a question if you're if you need me, but you guys, you, you know, don't ever feel like you have to, to, to speak English just for me. I'm happy to accommodate and help where I can. And I think that's really important is people have that ability to um, really like plan through and think through in, in each place with their, with their own cultural context and their own language. There's um, a, a, an interesting point I thought you made about the region and how it works together. Uh, and then maybe we can close with, you could tell us about the size of this region that you're working in for a visual for people who are listening. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I've certainly, um, so I've been um, in the region, I came out to go to school at University of Guam Marine Lab and, and even there made friends of, from people from all over the region who were students there. So I um, still have friends working in, I was a student with Dr. Uh, Yim Golbu. I was a student with um, Stephen Victor, who is now the Minister of um, Agriculture, Forestry, and Environment in Palau. You know, so lots of people from around. 
Um, and I've always been amazed at how, you know, I, when you look at other places, so for example, the Coral Triangle Initiative, although it's a region of sorts, it's really different that, you know, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands are, um, net, don't interact really with the Philippines on a regular, you know, it's not sort of culturally or, or tied. And whereas I think Micronesia, when you look at it, you know, that even for, um, well be before, uh, you know, the, the European explorers showed up, people were moving across, right? You see the, the amazing traditional navigation charts, you have, you know, people were connected and they were moving across, they were sharing, you know, they were trading, maybe sometimes fighting, but they were they definitely um, a, a, you know, it was, there was definitely connectivity. And then certainly post-war with the U.S. trust territories, there was a lot of connectivity. A lot of people would move to Saipan and work in Saipan. And, and you know, they, you also have the wonderful Xavier High School. People moved over to, to attend Xavier. So I feel like it's just a place that really is connected, you know, there, yeah, everybody has their own cultures and their own identity, but they really, you know, when I've seen people in a big UN meeting, Micronesians really are together, like it's a group, you know, it really feels like a, um, there is a real sense of we're, we're small, but to point when you look at it, it crosses like four time zones, you know, it's like crossing basically the continental United States, it's a really big area of these tiny, beautiful little jewels across this ocean. And the, it, when you do, um, we haven't been able to travel much because of COVID, but when you do get together, you see a real sense of like, like people are connected. And there is a real sense of um, camaraderie around being a part of Micronesia. So at least from the outside, that's what it feels like. And I feel like I've been adopted in, but it is, it's, it just seems like a real sense of community for sure. Thank you so much, um, Trina, for sharing uh, your work. Do you have any final words that you'd like to share with us before we close? Um, no, just, I think it's uh, wonderful that you have these, that, that people can get to know more about the islands. So we really, really appreciate the Office of Island of, um, Office of Insular Affairs for showcasing the islands. And, and so thank you for, thank for you doing much. that and for having me on. Absolutely.